Matthew chapter 27 and verse 45. Matthew 27, 45 for our message from the Word of God this morning. You'll find it on page 1042 if you've chosen to use the Pew Bible this morning. This morning being October 14th. 2018. Our text is going to be in Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46. And the title of this morning's message is, <clears throat> Why Does God Allow People to Suffer? Why Does God Allow People to Suffer? A question that I'm sure you know people often wonder about. But we begin with some other questions that people often wonder about. For instance, if you throw a cat out the window of your car, <laughs> does it become kitty litter? Ah, no. Kitty, you know? No? <laughs> Why did Japanese kamikaze pilots wear helmets? I mean, if they plan to crash the plane into the ship. Why doesn't Tarzan have a beard? Then there are some slightly less silly questions that I wonder about. <clears throat> Why do they call it a television set if you've only got one? <laughs> or, how come there's a light in your refrigerator but not in your freezer? Huh? <laughs> well then, of course, there's the question that just might be the most serious question of all. Why does God allow people to suffer? It's a question that people often ask when they are suffering pain and distress. It's a question that even Christians ask when suffering pain and distress. Because when it happens, it feels like God has forsaken them. And when it happens, we have to do what the Lord did. When He was suffering, and He asked God why He had forsaken Him. I direct your attention at this time to Matthew 27. Verse 45, where we read these words. Now from the sixth hour, <clears throat> there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As the Lord was suffering the, the pain and distress of the cross, He cried out and asked why God had forsaken Him. But now, how many of you think the Lord didn't know why He'd been forsaken of God? <clears throat> 
How many of you think he didn't know that his father had to forsake him because he had been made sin for us? That God had laid all of our sins on him. And because of that, he had to forsake him. Because as Habakkuk said to God in your first cross reference in Habakkuk 1.3, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. God Almighty cannot look on iniquity. So He couldn't look on His own Son as He bore our iniquities. So he turned his back on his son and forsook him. And we know the Lord knew that because he was quoting Psalm 22 and verse 1, your next reference. A psalm that begins, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That psalm is what theologians call a messianic psalm a psalm about the Lord Jesus Christ and that particular messianic psalm is all about the Lord Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross now he only had enough breath to quote the first verse because crucifixion robs you of your breath but he quoted it to let you know he was thinking the rest of the psalm on the cross. And some of what he was thinking that day is in your next reference in Psalm 22 and verse 6 where he said, I am a worm and no man. Now, the reason he called himself a worm on the cross is because of what you read in the next reference in Mark 9. Verse 45, where the Lord talked about hell, the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not. As people in hell suffer the wrath of God on their sins, folks, they are reduced to a worm-like state. So, when the Lord called Himself a worm, it was because He understood He was suffering the wrath of God on our sins. The wrath that you'll have to endure for all eternity if you don't believe that He suffered the wrath for you. So if you're not saved, I would encourage you to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again. But now we know the reason he was quoting Psalm 22. It was because Psalm 22 explains why he had to suffer. So in quoting it, he was reminding himself of the reason for his suffering. Because folks, once you know the reason for your suffering, it makes it a whole lot easier to bear your suffering, doesn't it? Amen. Especially if you know you're suffering for a good reason like the Lord did. Well, the Lord knew the reason for His suffering. That means the only reason he asked God why he had forsaken him is so that we would know that he was reminding himself of the reason for his suffering. And he did that so that we would know that that's what we're supposed to do when we suffer. How many of you think it would make your suffering easier to bear if you knew the Bible reason that you had to suffer? Sure. That's why this morning we're going to learn the Bible answer to the question of why people have to suffer. And believe it or not, this question is one that has to be answered dispensationally. Dispensationally. 
because there are different Bible answers to the question of why people suffer, some of which apply to us and some of which don't. So let's start with Adam and find out why he had to suffer. What did God tell Adam when he created him in your next reference in Genesis 2 and verse 17? He talked about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he told Adam, Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. God told Adam he would die if he ate of that tree. And he did die spiritually that very day. But he also began to die physically by a long process that involved pain and suffering. So, the first time Adam got sick, <laughs> if he asked himself, why do I have to suffer this? All he had to do was do what the Lord Jesus Christ did and remind himself of the reason for his suffering. And that would make it easier to bear. And the reason I'm reminding you of why Adam had to suffer, because the primary reason why we have to suffer is the same reason. Isn't that what Paul says in Romans 5 and verse 12? By one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The reason we have to suffer in life, folks, the primary reason is because we sinned in Adam. You say, well, how's that work? Well, remember what it says in Hebrews 7, 9, and 10. Levi paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father Abraham. But when, listen, Levi lived an awful long time before his grandfather Abraham. <laughs> or an uh, awful long time after his father Abraham. But when Abraham tie, uh, paid those tithes, Levi paid them in him, in Abraham. Now we can't get into how all of that works, but listen. If you don't believe that you sinned in Adam, then you cannot believe that you suffered for your sins in Christ on Calvary's cross. And if you can't believe that, you cannot be saved. But because we sinned in Adam, we have to endure the same long process of pain and suffering that he did that ends up in death if the Lord doesn't come. So that's the primary reason why we have to suffer. Then, the more we disobey God in our personal lives, our own lives, the more suffering in life we incur. Something we'll see as we move on in our Bibles to Abraham who disobeyed God. Remember what God told him in Genesis 12 verse 1? Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. Now listen, that's another verse where the little words are important. You see that word had when it says the Lord had said this to Abraham? You're reading something that God had told Abraham years earlier. It took Abraham years to decide to obey God and go to the land of Canaan. 
And listen, that was disobedience to God's Word. God didn't tell him, wait a bunch of years and then go to Canaan. <laughs> he said, go! And Abraham disobeyed him when he delayed. And his disobedience caused him some suffering in his life. As Genesis 12 goes on to say in verses 4 to 6, Abraham departed into Canaan, and the Canaanite was then in the land. By the time Abraham got to the promised land, folks, Satan had filled that land with his people. You say, what kind of people? And the kind of people you read about in the next chapter in Genesis 13, verse 13. The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. By the time Abraham got around to obeying God, folks, Satan had filled that land with the kind of people that God's people don't like to be around. Speaking of Abraham's nephew in your next reference in 2 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8, it talks about just Lot. That means he's righteous, he's just. That's Abraham's nephew. And, and how he was fit, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing, imagine that, out in the daylight, practicing homosexuality in Sodom, and hearing it through the walls at night, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So when Abraham failed to obey the Word of God, folks, and go to the land of Canaan like God commanded, it caused him even more suffering than he inherited from Adam. Because those Sodomites were living in his land. I know eventually God rained fire and brimstone down on those cities and destroyed them. But listen, the rest of those Canaanites weren't no picnic either. They were wicked in other ways. As Abraham found out when they robbed his nephew Lot and kidnapped his nephew Lot. And Abraham had to gather an army of 318, was it, men and go rescue him. Now, all of that reminds me to say that when we ask the question, why does God allow people to suffer? We're not just talking about suffering, pain, physical pain. We're also talking about all the things we have to suffer. All the things in life that vex us mentally and emotionally. With, with problems with our spouse, our, our kids, our boss, and our neighbors. Some of those problems come your way because of Adam's sin and the effect that Adam's sin had on all those other people in your life. <laughs> but you invite more of those problems into your life when you disobey God. And I don't have to tell you that a life filled with problems and difficulties and, and other vexations with, with people can be just as miserable as a life filled with physical pain. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? The things you let into your life, folks, by disobeying God can introduce misery in your life that will haunt you for the rest of your life oftentimes. So you're better off learning to obey the Word of God. I hope that's why you come here Sundays and Wednesdays. You're better off learning to obey the Word of God right away. And you won't incur quite as much of that pain and suffering. Now, the example of Abraham's disobedience, that gives us another reason we suffer. Because what he was doing was reaping what he sowed. Something Paul says you have to do too in your next reference in Galatians 6 and verse 7. 
Whatsoever a man soweth, your apostle says, that shall he also reap. You can ignore the Word of God like Abraham did, but the principle of reaping and sowing is interdispensational. Because it's always true in any dispensation, if you sow beans, you're going to reap beans, right? And if you sow evil, what does Job say you're going to reap in Job 4 and verse 8? They that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. So sometimes you could point your finger at Adam for your suffering, but sometimes you've got to point, turn that finger around and point it right back at yourself and admit you're reaping what you sowed. And the thing, <laughs> the thing about reaping and sowing that every farmer knows is you don't just reap what you sow, you reap a whole lot more than what you sowed. No farmer ever bothered to go out on a hot day, plow the land, and, and plant a hundred bushels of beans, and then water it, and weed it, and fertilize it, and fence it to keep it, keep it safe, and then go through the trouble of reaping it, if all he's going to get back is a hundred bushels of corn, or wheat, or whatever it is. He does all that because he knows he's going to reap much more. And that holds true for sowing sin as well. Speaking of some sinners in Israel in Hosea 8 and verse 7, what's God say? They have sown the wind and they're going to reap the whirlwind. And you will too if you disobey the Word of God. Now, when we sin, we, we never think much will come of it, but Adam probably didn't think so either. But now... We have two primary reasons now then uh, why people have to suffer. We have to suffer because of Adam's sin. Then we have to suffer because we reap what we sow. I call those reasons two primary reasons because it doesn't matter if you're saved or unsaved. Those reasons will cause suffering in all of our lives. But now as we move on in the Bible, we'll see reasons that God's people suffer. Let's begin with why God's people in Israel had to suffer. Uh, God gave them a law, as you know in Leviticus 26.14, that said, If ye will not do all these commandments and break my covenant, I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. In other words, that's, that's a poetic way of saying, I'm going to shut off the rain. <laughs> and they, your, your earth will be as hard as brass. And your land will not yield her increase. You won't be able to grow anything in that. And I will also send wild beasts among you, which will rob you of your children. So listen, when the Jews under the law found themselves suffering things like droughts, and they ask themselves, well, why are we suffering this? If they did what the Lord Jesus Christ did and remembered the Word of God, they'd know why they're suffering, just like He knew. God had been very clear about the terms of the contract. That's what a covenant is, a contract. So when their land wasn't yielding crops... Because of the drought, they didn't have to wonder why. I share this verse with you often in Jeremiah 14.4. They came to the pits and found no water. The ground was chapped like your lips get when they're dry. For there was no rain in the earth and the plowmen were ashamed. Now, I've told you many times, my, my uncle was a farmer in Grant Park, Illinois, south of here, half an hour, and he was never ashamed when it didn't rain, because when it didn't rain, he knew it wasn't his fault. But when it didn't rain in Israel, the farmers were ashamed, because they knew it was their fault. And if it wasn't their fault personally, they were a commonwealth. God dealt with the nation as a whole. If the people of Israel as a whole were wicked, even the, the good farmer had to suffer for that. 
And it wasn't just droughts that reminded them what the Word of God said. Do you remember what happened to Elisha in your next reference in 2 Kings 22, 23, and 24? Elisha went up from thence, and as he was going, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said, Go up, thou bald head! Go up, thou bald head! Apparently, Elisha was follically challenged, is what we call it today. But you know why they were saying that? His mentor Elijah had gone up in a cloud to the heaven. And they were saying, yeah, if you think you're, you're all that, you're like Elijah, you do that too. And he turned back and cursed them. And there, were, there came two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Now listen, when that happened... Every Jewish parent who lost a child that day probably asked God why He allowed it to happen. And if they did, and if they did what the Lord told them to do, if they did what the Lord did hanging on the cross, well, they would know, right? They would know. Now we turned the page too early there. If they remembered the word of God that he had told them, that if they were bad, he'd send wild beasts among them, they'd have known what was causing their suffering. Now all of that will help explain a very strange verse in Amos 3 and verse 6. Amos 3 says, and there shall be or shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it. <laughs> oh wait a minute. The answer to that question in the cities of Israel was no. There couldn't be evil in a city that the Lord hadn't done, not in Israel. Because the kind of evil it's talking about, folks, is the kind that God said that he would send them if they disobeyed him. The evil of droughts and wild animals and a bunch of other things in the law that God threatened them with if they disobeyed. But there can be evil in cities today that God hasn't done, folks. There was evil in many cities in the United States back when the, the drought was so bad it created the, the Dust Bowl. How many of you remember the Dust Well, you don't remember it, but you remember reading about the, the Dust Bowl. But that was an evil that God had nothing to do with. There can also be evil in your personal life that God doesn't have anything to do with. If you lived in Alaska near a bunch of wild bears like Jesse and I saw when we were in Alaska and some of them came out of the woods and, and killed your child, would you conclude it was because you broke the law, you broke the Ten Commandments? Well, no, you wouldn't because you're a grace believer. You know what Paul says in Romans 6.15 that we're not under that law. We're under grace. You know you never agreed to the terms of that covenant. You never promised to obey the law or accept God's punishment if you didn't, like the Jews did in your next reference. Moses laid before their faces, laid it all out, all the words which the Lord had commanded him, and all the people answered together, all that the Lord hath spoken we will do. They heard the terms of the covenant of the law and they ratified it. So God was righteous when, when He sent those bears among them when they broke the law. But you never agreed to the terms of the law, so God would be unrighteous to send bears and tear your kids. That's how you know when it happens, because it does happen, that God didn't send them. But now, while you know all that as grace believers, you also know that there are Christians who think they are under the law 
And when they lose a child, it haunts them. And they will spend their lives wondering if God is punishing them for their disobedience. When Wayne and Nicole lost their darling little one-year-old girl, they didn't have to wonder if God was punishing them. How many of you were here for that funeral? Anybody? Raise your hand. A few of you. I never... I always talk about how when you go to a funeral, the six people carry the casket in. And that day, the one man carried the casket in because it looked like a bassinet. It was so small. Can I remind you that the grace message that teaches people we're not under the law, we're under grace, is the most spiritually liberating message on the face of the earth. But now, there's something you need to remember about all that business of being under grace, not law. When the Galatians put themselves under the law, Paul wrote them this scathing letter to remind them they're not under the law. But after he got done, he got to, after he got done pounding that home, he got to the end of the epistle, and that's when he said that verse we saw earlier in your next reference in Galatians six seven: "Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap." He reminds them that they might not be punished for breaking the law, but they're still under the law of reaping and sowing. And there's a reason he has to tell them that. And the reason is because when Christians first hear they're not under the law, sometimes they get the idea that they can get away with sin. As you see in a fuller quote of of, uh, Romans 6.15, Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid! That's the full quote. When some Christians find they're not under the law, they think they can mock God by living in sin. And that's why the fuller version of Galatians 6-7 says, Be not deceived. Don't fool yourself thinking that. God is not mocked just because He's not punishing you when you're bad. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You can live in sin if you want to. God's not going to punish you. But if you refuse to obey His Word, you're going to reap what you sow. And you're oftentimes not, usually not going to like what you reap. But when you do, that's not God judging you because you broke the Ten Commandments. When the Jews sinned and God sent them a drought, folks, He had to supernaturally mess with the laws of nature to do that. But when God says to you in Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, if you ignore that every day of your life, you're going to suffer the destruction of your liver that's supposed to filter out poisons. You drink poison every day of your life and your liver says, I've had it. <laughs> you know? And that is not God supernaturally judging your liver. That's you reaping what you sowed. God also tells believers in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee fornication. If you don't flee fornication, you're going to end up with a social disease. That will cause you all kinds of pain and suffering in the flesh. Or, the other kind of pain and distress we've been talking about. Trouble in your marriage. Trouble in your personal life if you're not married. Sin always complicates things, folks. But that's not God supernaturally inflicting pain or trouble on you. That's just you reaping what you sow. But now we have to ask why God allows us to reap what we sow and why He allows us to reap what Adam sowed. (laughs) When we're good and obey His Word, why doesn't He just spare us having to suffer? Like He did for the Jews when they were good. Look what you read in your next reference. 1 Samuel 10, 17-19 Thus saith God, I saved you to Israel, 
Out of all your adversities, and I saved you out of all your tribulations. When the Jews were good under the law, they could count on God to deliver them from their adversities or any tribulations that came their way. But under grace, God allows you to go through tribulations and then uses them to work some good things in you like you read in Romans 5.3. Paul says, tribulation works patience. Now listen, tribulation doesn't work patience automatically. <laughs> I don't know about you, but my natural reaction to tribulation in the flesh is impatience. The only way tribulations work patience is when we do what the Lord did when He was suffering His tribulations. And stop and remember what the Word of God says. Why we're suffering. What's Paul say why we're suffering in Acts 14.22? We must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Compare that to what... God told Israel, He's not going to spare you tribulation. He's going to let you go through it. And if you'll remember that, when you're going through your tribulation, it'll make it easier to bear. But here's the thing. You have to remember what the Word of God says to you. Because listen, when I get sick, I'd get pretty impatient if I thought the next reference was written to me. In Deuteronomy 7, 12 to 15, God told Israel, If you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, the Lord will take away from thee all sickness, and I'll put none of the evil diseases of Egypt upon you. The reason that reading that makes you impatient is because it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because that was God's promise to them, not to you. Do you know what will work patience in you? Knowing what God told Paul when he got sick. In your next reference, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Something hurt. Did you ever have a thorn in your flesh? He's talking about pain here, folks. I besought the Lord that it might depart, and He said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Can you be patient in tribulation if you know God's power is being made perfect in your weakness? God can do a whole lot more with a patient believer than He can with an impatient believer. Did you notice that Paul says this, this thorn was given to him? What do we call things that are given to us? A gift! You say, well, what kind of sick, sadistic God thinks pain and suffering is a gift? Well, when I was a kid, we used to insult one another. We'd say, that guy's so dumb that when God was handing out brains, he thought he said pains, and he hid behind the door. Well, you'd hide behind the door too when God was handing out pains, unless you knew that pain is God's gift. I've told you the story before. When I was a teenager, my dad and I were building a, a mini bike in his tool and die shop. Most of my neighbor friends were just slapping a lawnmower engine on their bicycles, and dad said, Well, the frame's too wimpy to support that. Being a machinist, he said, Let's let's make you a nice solid frame. So he was welding two pipes together, and uh, uh, he, to keep them straight in a line, he put a pin inside. And when he got done, the, he lifted the pipe and the pin fell out and I picked it up, but I didn't hold it very long. Because <laughs> if you know anything about arc welding, you know the metal gets really, really hot. And I had a blister on my thumb, biggest blister I've ever had in my life to prove it. Because I grabbed that thing. And Dad just laughed and said, well, that's how you learn. <laughs> But do you know what would have happened if my thumb had not felt the searing pain that day? I'd have continued holding that pin until the flesh of my thumb and my fingers were really badly damaged. Ever heard of Hansen's disease? 
That's a disease that makes it so you can't feel pain. You say, well, wow, sign me up for that. No, you don't want that. That's not a gift. That's a curse. If I'd had Hansen's disease that day, I'd have held on to that pin until I heard the flesh sizzling or smelled it frying. Because my other senses of pain weren't telling me to drop it. And it works internally too. When Rex's appendix began to rupture, if it didn't hurt like nobody's business, he wouldn't have gone to the doctor to find out why he'd have died instead. Pain is your body's outward signal that something wrong inside. Without pain, you'd never try to find out what's, what it is and fix it. So pain is God's gift even in the original design and creation of man. And then, if you factor in how God can use your pain, in believers anyway, to work patience, well, you'll say what Paul says about your pains in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Rather than what? Rather than keep on praying like he'd been praying to God to take him away. I'd rather glory in them that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I take pleasure in infirmities for when I am weak, then am I strong. The way to deal with sufferings in life, folks, is to do what the Lord did in His sufferings and remember what the Word of God says to you. That, that spiritual virtues like patience are much more important than your physical comfort. Now, if that's not enough to make you feel better about your suffering, look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. We faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction... And listen, don't think Paul, well, Paul evidently didn't have my kind of afflictions. He wouldn't call it light if he did. You just re go home and read 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 33 and find out what he was afflicted with. He's just saying that compared to what God has in, plan in mind for us, it's nothing. It's light. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. Now here you thought your afflictions were working against you. Paul says they're working for you. They're working rewards for you at the judgment seat of Christ. God plans to reward you for suffering physical pain. Now why would He do that? Well folks, it's because you don't live under the time of the law when God's people were rewarded with good health if they were good. So He plans to reward you in heaven instead. And, and if that doesn't keep you from what doing what Paul said, they're fainting over, over your tribulations. It is because you're not doing what the rest of 2 Corinthians 4 says there in verses 16 to 18. We faint not, though our outward man perish, while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. If your tribulations are causing you to, to faint, to, to lose strength, it's because you're not doing what the Lord did when He suffered His tribulations on the cross. You're not remembering what God says about your tribulations. You're looking at temporal things instead of eternal things. And if that's not enough to get you to rejoice in your tribulations, to glory in them, to rather have them than not have them, as Paul said, there's one final reason God allows His people to suffer. It's found in what He says in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. God comforteth us, comforteth us in all our tribulation. Why? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble 
by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God comforts you in your tribulation by reminding you of the value of your tribulations in, from the Word of God, as we've seen. But He doesn't just comfort you to make you comfortable. He comforts you to make you a comforter. To take the Word of God that comforts you in your tribulations and, and use it to comfort others in theirs. Listen, when those she-bears killed those 42 kids, I guarantee you that those 84 parents didn't all of them remember that the law had said that God would send wild beasts among them if they were bad. So some of those parents had to remind the others of what the Word of God says so they, so they wouldn't think that God, their God was laying down on the job when it came to protecting them. And beloved, not everybody knows the Word of God like you do. Not everybody knows the things that we've covered in this message. And when other people suffer, it's up to you to comfort them with the Word of God. And assure them they're not suffering because God's judging them. And tell them why they have to suffer things and the value of that. The bottom line for why God allows us to suffer is in that last reference. In Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 14. Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes and boy, he was a philosopher, wasn't he? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. <laughs> well, so far, so good. I mean, most of us don't have any problem with that, right? But, in the day of adversity, moan and whine and complain and, 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 and ask why is God... No, no, consider. God has also set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. He says, when you have to suffer adversities, think about the fact that God's allowing you to do that so you don't find anything in any other thing in life but Him. You've heard me say, if this life were perfect, no one would ever think about the next life. You may not have been here. The I think I only told you the story one time of the homeless man who stopped at BBS a few years ago and wanted to know how to be saved. After I led him to the Lord, I asked him, well, how'd you come to be homeless? And he said, well, a year or so before that, he'd been shot in the chest during a carjacking. And he survived. But he survived only to be diagnosed with terminal cancer shortly after. Then his wife started having an affair and moved her lover into the house. So he moved out on the streets rather than live you know, in the house. She told him he could sleep on the couch, but he passed on that. Except when it was below zero. Then he asked me, a question. The question. He asked me, why did God allow all that to happen to me? And I pointed to all the traffic on busy Mequon Road if you've been up to BBS and I said, see all those people driving by? They're not stopping into Berean Bible Society today to ask how to be saved. And neither would you be if those things hadn't happened. I said, be honest. God allows suffering because He knows life is short and eternity is long. We tend to think that this life is the most important thing and how comfortable we can make ourselves in it. But God knows the next life is much more important. So he allows the unsaved to suffer to draw them to him to get saved. And he allows believers like you to suffer to draw you to serve him. But it only works 
when we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. In other words, it only works when you do what the Lord did in the midst of His suffering and remember the reasons you're suffering. God help us to do that, and God help us to do others to do that to help others to do that as well. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you're not afraid of the tough questions. And we're eternally grateful that as grace believers who know how to rightly divide your word, we don't have to be afraid of the tough questions either. We don't have to shy away from the verses that say that we won't be sick if we're good because we understand who they're written to. And we pray that as we prepare this book that it might be something that will be used of the something of eternal value in the lives of your people. Those who are haunted by the questions of whether or not you're punishing them. Those who we long to see come to rejoice with us in the riches of your grace. And we pray it all in Christ's name.